Sweet promises given to all who believe. Behold, I come to Bible for class. Today we are going to look at the fourth phase of biblical hermeneutics. And our presentation is done in several parts. And the first part we have here, we're going to look at interpreting the law, how to interpret the law, and how to interpret Old Testament narrative. That will be the first part. And the second part, uh, we'll look at the other uh, genres. And the third part, fourth part, um, look at other genres too. So let's look at the first part for now. Interpreting the law. In the Bible, we read many places where God commanded his people to do this or that. Sometimes we feel that some of the commandments were meant only for the ancient people, but not for us today. Other times, we feel comfortable with certain commandments. Now, for any relationship to survive and grow healthily, some rules have to be observed. And this is a very clear thing that we all know. In the Bible, God, the creator being, makes provision for all his creatures and set clear rules to keep his relationship with them as they enjoy his provisions. In short, God never gives commandment rules without showing grace. So God provides something for the well-being of his uh, creation and then he will give rules on how to regulate uh, that relationship. There are other rules, laws, that predate the laws in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. What we are saying here is that before the giving of the law to Moses, there were other commandments that God gave that should always be considered when we are treating uh, or when we want to interpret the law in the Old Testament. All the rules, all the laws were given in particular social cultural contexts, which have to be appreciated before any application is done. So to understand any law, we must know the circumstances in which um, that law was given. Now, rules for interpreting the law. Number one is that we must examine the religious context or the origin of the law as rooted in a creation account principle. During creation, God um, gave laws governing sexuality, and that is, sex should happen between male and female to produce or multiply themselves. Laws also were given concerning food, what has to be eaten, and sexually uh, also uh, Sabbath. Um, was celebrated even though it was not given as a commandment, but later on it was given as a commandment to the Jews, and that also had antecedent in creation. There's also the principle of covenantal principle, and this means that the law that was given to the Jews um, was actually to regulate the the, the covenant between God and his people, Israel, that he chose. So we call this particular law the Senatic uh, Covenant um, Laws of morality, sacrifices, uh, purity, civil, and food laws. So there are several laws that were given in the context of the uh, Senatic Covenant, uh, you know, relationship between God and his people. So anytime we want to interpret any law, we must understand the religious context. Is it in the creation uh, account setting? Is it in the covenantal um, uh, setting? Which means that if you're able to determine that, um, we will appreciate how to interpret the law and to know the immediate audience that the law uh, was um, 
uh, applicable to. You must determine the target audience for compliance, as in only Israelites in focus. In other words, the immediate audience of the law. So certain laws that were given to um, uh, given to the people of God in the Old Testament uh, were applicable to only the Israelites. So read from Exodus to Deuteronomy. And we have certain or other laws that were applicable to both Israelites and non-Israelites. So when you read these passages, you see that particularly um, laws on sexuality, uh, laws on the celebration of the seventh day Sabbath, laws on uh, food, and laws on other uh, moral um, uh, decisions uh, were applicable to both Jews and non-Jews. And so we need to appreciate that. One key example is that the law on Passover was not applicable to non-Israelites. The law on sexuality was applicable to both Jews and non-Jews. The law on uh, food was applicable to both Jews and non-Jews. And, um, um, you know, so it is important that we appreciate uh, these uh, uh, emphasis. Note that the purity laws were tied to sanctuary services. Therefore, if those services are obsolete, we are not mandated to keep as basis for maintaining relationship with God today. So in the Old Testament, particularly in the uh, Synatic Covenant laws, God instituted uh, purity laws. And these laws were tied to sanctuary services. And so if there are no more in other words, if the sanctuary services, um, the regulations of the sanctuary services are no more relevant today, then we are not bound to keep the uh, purity uh, laws. You must identify the form of the law as to whether it is general principle that is apodictic law. So uh, it's important if you have two forms in the uh, you know, in, in reference to the form of the law. So if, it's, if the law has a general principle application, it is called apodictic law. For example, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, it reads, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone. It's a general principle. And so it doesn't really matter whether you are a Jew or not, it's applicable. And um, it's very clear what this law states. Now, so that's what we uh, find, and we can also find same in Exodus 20, uh, verse 12. Or, or so the first uh, form is the apodictic law, general law, or the law is conditional. So conditional principle, that is casuistic law. Casuistic laws begins usually with uh, a condition. It's called a conditional law. So if, if, so Exodus chapter 22, verse 14, Reads, if anyone borrows an animal from um, their neighbor and it is injured or dies while the owner is not present, they must make restitution. And so that is if. And so this law is um, conditional. And we look at later on how to interpret um, you know, the forms, some forms, because some forms of the law uh, may not be applicable um, today, but the meaning uh, will be. And so if this doesn't happen, you don't fulfill this law. And so that is the point. We must determine the historical setting of the law under study as to whether Israel's neighbors use the same law and for what purpose. Here, a comparative analysis will be appropriate to appreciate biblical emphasis and its historical principle. So historical principle, um, that is adopted here is that we must know if the neighbors of Israel had same law and for what purpose. So let's look at Exodus chapter 21, verse 35. It reads, If anyone's bull injures someone else's bull and it dies, the two parties are to sell the live one and divide both the money and the dead animal equally. So that's what we have in scripture. Now, when we look at ancient Near East tests, 
Israel's neighbors, social contest. There's a test that's, that um, comes to us from the Ashuna Legal Code, the, uh, you know, um, the Mesopotamian city that existed um, from um, uh, 2000 to uh, 1800 BC. And the test reads, if an ox goes an other ox and causes its death, both ox owners shall divide among themselves the price of the life ox and also the equivalent of the dead uh, ox. Now, so the, the whole idea is that if you look at these two tests, the biblical test and the uh, Shinona legal code, you see that they have the same idea. So it's possible, it's possible and the law of Moses, or let's say the law in Exodus was written later. So this is the earlier test. So it means that God saw, um, you know, a sense in this particular uh, law in the Ashina Legal Code and, uh, you know, uh, gave to uh, Israel. Now, the difference is uh, who gave the law? Here, their earthly king gave the law. But in the Bible, it was God who gave the law. And he gave the law as the one who delivered them from Egypt. And so when they were obeying this law, the, 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 the Jews were to see this obedience as um, obedience to the creator being who had the right to give uh, a law to regulate the relationship between them and the creator being. So uh, the motivation for uh, obedience is based on his deliverance and, and also to maintain relationship with them. Whereas you go to the Ashina legal code, the motivation is um, just to make sure that um, there's peace you know, between you and your neighbor. But when you go to the Israelites, uh, you know, uh, contest, apart from ensuring peace between you and your neighbor, you also uh, have uh, a motivation to obey the law because God has said so. We have another example. Um, here also you have the biblical test. You are the children of the Lord, your God. Do not cut yourselves or shave the front of your Hence, for the dead, Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 1. The ancient Near Eastern text from Ugarit revealed that worshippers of Baal cut themselves as a ritual as they mourn their dead. So you can see here also another test from the Ugarit um, suggests that people should cut themselves for the dead. And God is saying that you don't have to do that. So you can see where it is necessary for God to use a, an existing law uh, it, 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 it does use, and what is not necessary, um, he says, you know, don't use this because when he uses, um, your heart will be uh, taken away from me, and you worship other gods, and you forget that I delivered you, and so because Baal did not deliver you, you cannot uh, cut yourselves. So don't cut yourselves because when you cut yourselves um, to mourn your your you're, you're dead. Your heart will be taken away from me. Number six, we must compare a law appearing more than once to help us appreciate its historical and theological emphasis in its um, occurrences. And so, if you have one particular law that is repeated more than you know once, we must compare the you know the, the the occurrences and see the emphasis that the author uh, gives or what th that god gives to each um, repetition so for example the law on sabbath in exodus 20 when you read the motivation is that god rested and so that's an example that has been set for Israelites also to rest on the Sabbath. When you read Deuteronomy chapter 5, the motivation for keeping the Sabbath, and here the context is important because 
the Jews were getting close to their promised land. And God told them that they were slaves once. And so on Sabbath, and, you know, he wanted them to let the servants or the maid servant of the Jews to also rest. And God stressed that and that motivation um, should remind them of their deliverance. So when you let your slave rest on the Sabbath, you are reminded of the deliverance of God uh, from Egyptian bondage. And so these two um, emphases in these two passages, respectively, uh, should help one to understand the use or the need for repeating a particular law in the Old Testament. So that is one point that we need to note, and that we are saying that we are doing intertextual inter um, exegesis or principle is applied here. Seventh is that we must find out whether the New Testament affirmed the law. So Matthew chapter 5 verse 7. In other words, if you want to interpret the law, to apply the law today, find out if the New Testament applies uh, in the law in, in, in different ways. And then the first way is whether the New Testament affirmed the law, that the law has been obeyed. Whether the New Testament nullified a given law, and we see how uh, Jesus uh, nullifies some of the laws, that you have heard that you should hate uh, your enemy or something like that, and I tell you that you should not do that. Um, or the New Testament modifies a law. So a law on divorce, this is what was said in the Old Testament, that you just prepare a certificate to divorce your wife. And Jesus says, no, you don't do that. You have to, according to Matthew, um, if you need to divorce your wife or your, your husband, um, the basis should be that um, your partner should have committed adultery, now has, has committed fornication. And so that's how the law is modified in the New Testament. So you go by what has been stated or modified in the New Testament uh, when it comes to uh, divorce. Now, uh, there's one law that Jesus modified which has ripple, uh, ripple effects, and that is don't pay evil with evil. And it's very clear and it summarizes how we relate to uh, our neighbors. Eighth, the law must be interpreted in a contemporary setting too. We must understand how to interpret the law uh, today. If the law mentioned in the Old Testament is never mentioned in the, Old, in the New Testament for affirmation, for nullification, for um, modification, it's never mentioned then we must follow this principle. We must remember that the people of Israel in Old Testament times lived under theocracy, that is, the rule of God. Because they live under God's rule, um, for example, when a child disobeyed a parent, the child was stoned to death. But now we are living in a democratic, if you want, non-theocratic dispensation. And therefore, we must be very careful which means that the law has to be viewed as having both religious and civil dimensions. So to find applicability of non-cultic laws, non-sacrificial um, laws, you know, non um, uh, purity laws, we must set boundaries between what can be implemented at the church level and the state level. Anything that the, your, your state, your country has um, enacted a law or pass a, a law uh, to regulate um, you know uh, healthy relationship uh, among uh, its citizens you must make sure that those laws uh, should be um, you know obeyed and the church must obey such laws and if there are laws that are limited or restricted to the operation of the church the relation between uh, members in the church, then uh, you follow your church manual and then you obey those uh, laws. So, so, um, but we must uh, first know the perspective of the Old Testament. That is, if you want to apply today, 
know what the Old Testament says on the law before applying the contemporary setting. Okay, so for example, well, when it comes to one committing a fornication in the Old Testament, the law required stoning. In the New Testament, in Palestine, uh, in Jesus' time, um, anyone who committed fornication, well, well, I mean, was to be stoned because the Romans allowed the Jews to uh, use their own laws to govern themselves. But outside Palestine, outside Palestine, in Rome, you could not do that. And so Paul, when he was writing to the Corinthians, said that the brother who had, uh, you know, committed fornication with his father's uh, wife, that person should be disfellowship. He could not be stoned because he was outside the, uh, the you know, the theocratic uh, dispensation. And so uh, you must apply this principle that in the church we can disfellowship someone who has committed or broken the law of God. Disfellowship or uh, just discipline. Uh, but we cannot take the life or imprison the person. We cannot do that. It's only the state that can do that. So that's one principle we must appreciate. If somebody, uh, you know, defrauds you and the person is a church member, well, in the church setting, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you can talk about it and see how things work. But if sometimes um, you think you, uh, the person is still not uh, responding to your, your calls, you can involve the state. After the church has done its best, the person is not responding. You can involve the state. And to help you retrieve your money. Now, the golden rule must be kept in mind, and that is love God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. If this is done, then you don't have trouble at all. Now, we looked at um, interpreting narrative. The greatest part of the Hebrew Bible is in narrative or storytelling form. The books of Genesis, Joshua, Judges, 1 and Kings, 1 and Chronicles, Nehemiah, Esther, Ruth, 1 and Samuel are the major ones. The picture of divine and human relationship is painted as it happened. And here the point is that when it comes to narrative in the Old Testament, you must remember that how events happened has been accurately presented. So God does not um, remove any negative happenings in the past regarding his relationship with his people, David, uh, Samuel, Samson, and the rest. And so everything has been accurately presented, both negative and positive. And that tells um, the nature of this um, word as the word of God is true. It doesn't hide anything. So, looking at Old Testament narrative, to I mean, interpret the Old Testament, one lesson that one can learn, basically is that, for whatever things were written before, were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, would have hope. Now, all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And so Paul, writing to the Romans and the Corinthians, mentioned that these things were written, these stories happened, um, for us to learn from. Biblical historians or storytellers aim to recount God's deeds in relation to the origin of the world, fall of humanity, salvation plan, and ultimate restoration. In recounting these storylines, the authors investigated and relied on both oral and written information, including their personal involvement in the events. And so these authors who were responsible for the, um, the writing of the stories or events that happened in the past, some um, of the authors were involved in the events. Others were not involved, and so they collected their data, um, you know, from the oral uh, stories told and also the written stories that have been uh, recorded and were available for use. How should we relate to these stories in the Bible? 
And so let's consider the following. First, you must know the following. You must know the following. You must know that the stories are historical because they deal with real human beings with real life issues. So there were human beings who lived in the past and how they related to God has been recorded for us. Okay, the story, or I say story, is artistic in that the author seeks to present the story artfully by emphasizing the setting, the character development, and plot development as well as the structure. So the stories were told fine, but when the author or the authors were writing, they have to put you know, the story as they happened, pre presenting the character um, development, in other words, the people who are in the story, and also the situations that uh, uh, gave birth to the story, present them as they happened, in a way that when you read, you actually feel attracted to the story and stay uh, close to the story. The, the story is entertaining in that it invites its readers to its world of heroic arts, drama, tragedy, comedy, and the like. As you read the story, you, you actually, your emotions are aroused because you see the dynamism of human story where we have heroes, we have uh, people who are also failing, and we have some and uh, bad ends and, and so forth. The story is holistic, holistic because um, they are not just sources that people put together, but they come together as one whole. So they are not only just sources, they are holistic. The story is selective. That is, only the ones that serve the purpose of the author are included. So when you are reading the story, you are not expected to know everything because they did not set out to write biography, autobiography. So they are only focusing on the purpose why this story has to be written. So they're giving many details. So don't try to fill in details. Just let the story tell you what it wants to tell you. The story is God-centered, hence the central character of the narrative text. And thus, this centrality unifies all the stories even or ever told in the Bible. So God is a central character of the stories we have in the Old Testament. The story is realistic in that they, um, uh, you know, the stories are realistic in that they are faithfully, uh, you know, uh, presented, and they don't present only the good side and leave out the bad side. Both are there, so you see the the heroism of the of the, of some of the characters, and you see the flaws of. Of, of, of some good characters that we love. And that should tell you that God is not ready to hide anything. He presents things as they happened. Now, the stories are dramatic because they picture how the ancient world dealt with love, hate, shame, honor, victory, tragedy, and the like. So dramatic. As you read, you feel that this is so dramatic, you know. Uh, the pain that uh, some of the people experience in the past, you can also experience that, the shame and all that. And also the story um, is revelatory in a sense that we hear God speaking to certain individuals. So the stories are not just human beings moving about. We also he, uh, hear God's interventions. So you, you see something like, and God spoke to Moses. Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. The story is responsive working for those who read uh, the story because the story contains lessons on morality and ethics. And so when you read, even though nobody will tell you that you should do this, but you can respond to the story um, looking at how some people in the story took some decisions and the end was not. Um, uh, you know, something that anyone would want. So, for example, Samson's uh, decision to be with Delilah, uh, after reading the story and looking at his end, you say, no, I don't want to be like that. I want to listen to my parents. The story is theological. 
because they focus on God as the one who reveals himself through words and deeds to human characters. And therefore, what is of ultimate importance is for a person to live as a faithful servant of Yahweh God, not as a superhero like Samson or a powerful politic king like Omri. The point here is very nice. And that is, at the end of you know, the day, when you read a narrative text in the Old Testament, just focus on God, how you can ob be obedient to God and His Word. It's good to be like Samson, it's good to be like David or Joseph and all that, but know that they are only human characters. And so, um, your devotion should not be to David or to anyone, but to God and see him as a main character who unifies the entire uh, story in the Old Testament. The second thing you must do as interpreter of a narrative text is first, identify the setting of the story which deals with a geographical elements. As you read the narrative, try to see you can identify where the locale, the place where the story happened, the climate, whether the where the story happened was hot, rainy, or windy, and also consider the topography, whether the story happened um, in the valley, plains, caves, desert, rivers, uh, seashores, and the like. B, also look at the setting of time, the time element, that is for, for situating the story in its historical context. So when did the story happen? And usually when you read Isaiah, for example, chapter 6, verse 1, you are told that um, as I received this vision uh, in the third year, on the first year of King, whatever. And so it is important to know when the story happened, the time element. The social connection, the setting, is important to know um, the social connection between Israel and her neighbors in terms of religion, politics, customs, and family relations. So the point here is that um, you must know when this particular event happened. When Let's say, for example, Israel was uh, in good relationship with uh, uh, the Philistines or with the Assyrians. And um, when King Sennacherib, for example, of the, of the Assyrians uh, decided to make um, a covenant with the, the king of Israel. And so the, the timing, in other words, the, 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 the social connection, the relationship between Israel and its neighbors, it's important to help us know the relevance and how to interpret a particular uh, story and also glean some lessons from the story. Now, second thing you do as you interpret the uh, narrative text is to analyze the plot structure. The plot structure here consists of the beginning, the development, and the climax. So each story has three dimensions. The story begins, it develops whether you have crisis and then climax, resolution. For example, you consider the story of Joseph and his brothers, how everything started, and then, you know, um, Joseph found himself in, in, a, in a foreign land, and finally, uh, the story ended well. Analyze, uh, the third thing is analyze character development, the rules of the characters in the story. And so they have several roles. So we have round characters like Moses, Around David and Solomon, who have positive qualities as well as um, flaws. And also, we have flat characters like kings of Egypt and Assyria, who remain the same in their behavior in the story. They, they, they never change in the story. And we have supporting characters like the magicians of Pharaoh and the chief official of King Nebuchadnezzar, whose roles made the stories complete. They are not really part of the main characters, they are only there for the story to, you know, uh, go on. Fourth, try to establish the purpose of the author or the narrator of the story by observing his comments while telling the story. And so you see that uh, in, in the stories, you see how the authors will uh, introduce a story. You know, for example, Genesis chapter 3, this, um, this one says that the snake was uh, wiser than all the animals that God had created. And so that should tell you what 
what the author is going to uh, tell you about the snake, what the snake actually did. Because he's wiser than all the animals, uh, he was able to uh, deceive um, Eve, um, if you want, Adam. And so try to see the comments of the author to appreciate the purpose of a particular story. Now, pay attention to different forms of communication employed by the author or the narrator, such as dialogue. So sometimes the story is presented in different uh, forms. So it can, it can be presented as a dialogue. So you see a dialogue between God and Moses, Solomon also and God. And also the story presented as an irony or satire. So you see a donkey speaking to Balaam in Numbers chapters chapter, chapter 22, verse 22 to uh, 35. And the story of Mordecai and Haman is ironical because um, Haman wanted Mordecai to be hanged, but um, Haman was um, hanged rather. So that's the irony. And the satire is when you see a donkey speaking to his owner. We also have repetition, and repetition is part of uh, um, the, the forms of communicating a uh, story. So you see the authors repeating themselves you know, regularly in their storytelling, and that was the culture of the Mediterranean people. So that is it. So we, we're looking at today um, the, the next form of communication, and that is inclusio. An inclusio is a rhetorical device used to mark a section of a text by repeating an introductory word, phrase, or idea at the, at the, um, at the, at the conclusion of the section. And so um, the way it sometimes presents the, 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 the story is, 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 is this way. That is, um, they use a particular word to begin the story, and that word will be used at the end of telling the story so that you see that this story is just one story. And, and when, when that is done, we call the story, uh, the form of the story, as an inclusio. And the last item also is uh, chiasmus. This is another way of uh, telling a story. And this chiasmus is a rhetorical device used in narrative texts. It is used when words, phrases, concepts are repeated in reverse order, in the same or modified structure. In this order, the central idea is the core emphasis of the narrator and so so example is presented here in numbers chapter 25 verse 1 to uh, 3. so in chiasm what happens is that this the first line or in other words the idea that's presented first is repeated at the end of the story but the focus of the author is in the middle so we have the repetition but what is in the middle is the focus and so we have here, when Israel was dwelling in Shittim, verse 1, the people profaned themselves by fornicating with the daughters of Moab. So that's what, they, what, that's what Israel did. Now, B, the second line, as the story progresses, um, we read verse 2, that they called the people to the sacrifices of their gods. And the people ate and drank to their gods. So that's what Israel did. Okay? that is uh, profaning themselves by fornicating with the daughters of Moab. Now, the verse, verse 3 repeats verse 1 in some way, and that is, thus Israel joined themselves to Baal Poah, so the anger of the Lord burned against Israel. So it's repeating what Israel did, you know, uh, by profaning uh, themselves. Now, we can see that a, that is verse 3, repeats verse 1, what Israel did. However, what is prime emphasis or importance is B, that is verse 2, the explanation of how Israel profaned or joined themselves to Baal Boa. So, verse uh, 2 is explaining how they did that. And how did they do that? They had to, uh, you know, make sac sacrifices. You know, to, to, to the gods of uh, those in uh, Moab. And so that is where the emphasis is. The sixth point is that you have to determine whether God may be using the story to teach a lesson about worship, ethical values, rewarding leadership, natural consequences of evil uh, doing. So, and that is that. So just try to find out that. 
if the lesson is teaching something in school. At the end of the day, you are learning lessons from stories. Avoid using single events as practice today, um, such as Exodus event, Elijah's miracles in ministry. Because Elisha performed miracle, because um, Moses performed miracle by turning um, a rod into a snake. Um, you know, you should not use narrative to really, you know, also uh, repeat same uh, miraculous events. M narrative test is not intended for, for I mean, to, to set a guide on how we should relate to, uh, uh, you know, God. In other words, because Moses did this, I can also do the same. I can go to a king today, any king or chief in my, in my, in my, in my um, area. And then uh, try to say that, well, I have a rod here and I want to turn into a snake. You know, there's no need to uh, have such a banter, you know, because you are not Moses. And that's the, that's the whole point. Eighth, we can act out, or let's say you can act out the stories in both children and adult classes during Bible teaching uh, sessions with modern names and settings to capture the attention of audience. Uh, we can develop the profile of the author or the narrator in many of the, the stories we, we have in the Old Testament. Uh, the authors are not known, but when you read the storyline and the comments, you will see who the author uh, probably uh, was in thinking and beliefs so that we appreciate the purpose of uh, writing. We can also uh, develop the profile of the audience. And here we are talking about the audience that the author had in mind when he was telling the stories. In other words, he um, you know, told the stories and his mind he was expecting some people, in other words, the Jewish community and uh, you know, later generation, uh, you know, to read the story. And after reading the story, what you know wanted the, the, the audience to um, demonstrate some uh, change after reading the story. So try to see if you can appreciate the profile of the audience that the author had in mind as he was um, writing the story. However, we should allow the text to speak as was intended to do. It's important. We should not force the narrative to speak something that we want the, the, the text to, 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 uh, to, to tell. We should let the story tell its own story. Twelve, we must appreciate the perspective of the narrator or the author. The first perspective is called psychological perspective. And here the author can read the mind of the characters in the story. And so we must appreciate how uh, we, we can detect the psychological perspective of the author. How can the author know what the character is thinking? Because he looks at the, uh, the, uh, the acts, you know, and the words or the deeds of the uh, characters. Now, the author can also evaluate, give his perspective, his understanding on the, um, the activity of the characters in the story. So we call this assessment evaluative perspective. So read these passages, for example, uh, Judges chapter 17, verse 6, the author will say, or the narrator will say, that the people did what they wanted to do because there was no king in Israel. It tells you what the author uh, believed to be the right thing to do because he was able to judge the character of the uh, characters in the story. Special perspective, the author could tell, um, you know, um, where something happened, where an event happened, even though the author was not there when it happened, but he had a broad perspective of where certain things happened. And also time perspective, you know, when certain things uh, happened, even though he never lived the, the time in which the event was told, but he could say that this king lived for how many years? 100 years, 200 years, or whatever years. Um, and by giving that perspective, it tells you that the author had a broader uh, perspective when it comes to time. And physiological perspective refers to how the author transitioned uh, from one story to another. And so usually you see words like behold, now. So the author is making a transition from one story to another. And they uses, and an author will use um, a phrase or word to do that transition. 
So that's the end of our presentation on how to interpret the law and narrative tests of the Old Testament. We hope you have enjoyed this class. If you have enjoyed, please share with your friends and the church and the world. And if you are yet to be a member of the Bible Talk class, subscribe so that you can receive the next episode. In the next episode, we are going to look at interpreting wisdom literature in poetry and Old Testament prophetic texts or word. Thank you. Sweet promises given to all who believe. Behold, I come quickly, mine own to receive. Hold fast till I come, the danger is great. Sleep not as do others.